The forthcoming general election in East Africa's populous nation Tanzania has not only elicited interest in the country but also generated a lot of keen attraction beyond its borders. The East African Law Society is among respectable leading organizations that have taken a keen interest in the much anticipated polls slated for later this month. As a result, the Regional Lawyers Organization has been hosting lively online interactive discourse with key players and experts to digest the democratic and political space in Tanzania with the sole aim of contributing towards the country's post-election harmony and tranquility. We are going to radicalize Africa. If you set out to stop radicalization, you are setting out for a confrontation with future Africa. Future Africa must be radicalized. We must change. Tanzania established itself as a Pan-African center to liberate nations on the continent from foreign and minority rule during the struggle for independence. The country's founding president, Julius Kambarage Nyerere, was a vocal critic of the whites and their allies who stood in the way to achieving the African majority rule in societies. Many freedom fighters from South Africa, Mozambique and Angola found a safe haven in Tanzania to organize, plan and execute their independence goals and aspirations from the country. Mimi, Johnny Pombe Joseph Magufuri, na hapa nitatenda kazi zangu za ulaisi wa Jamhuri ya Muungano wa Tanzania. When John Pombe Magufuli took over power in 2015 as the country's fifth president, many expressed optimism that the country would retain its glory as Africa's liberation model in terms of fighting corruption and cherishing democracy. But five years down the line, there have been growing concerns that President Magvuli is unapologetically reversing the country's post-Cold War legacy as the bastion of Africa's liberation movements, a subject that ignited a heated debate during the online discussion with the renowned law scholar Professor P. L. L. Mumba, putting up a spirited intellectual fight in defense of Magvuli. Democracy is bila vyama vingi na nasema hii bila kuhoi kwa hivyo tukijiuliza katika nchi ya Tanzania na tukiangalia vipengele vya demokrasia demokrasia kwa mtazamo wangu ni serikali ambao inawahusisha wananchi katika utawala na inawahusisha kwa namna gani inawapa nafasi ya kuachagua viongozi wao inawapa nafasi ya kujieleza inawapa nafasi ya kuhusika na kukutana na kujieleza kwa mujibu wa sheria iliyowekwa isieleweke ya kwamba katika demokrasia uhuru haina uwajibikaji kuna uhuru na uwajibikaji kwa hivyo tukisema ya kwamba Tanzania inapoteza hadhi yake katika mambo ya ukombozi tujiulize je ukombozi tunaoizungumzia sasa ni sawa na ukombozi ya miaka ya sitini, sabini na thamanini tatizo lililoko kwa hivi sasa na ndio kitovu cha mdahalo huu ni kwamba kuna watu ambao wanasema ya kwamba katika serikali ya wamu ya tano inayoongozwa na John Joseph Pombe Magufuli nafasi za upinzani zimeminywa na zimeminywa kwa kuwa wanasema viongozi wa upinzani wapati nafasi ya kujieleza kuna magazeti pia yamepigwa marufuku na hoja hiyo lazima itathminiwe na iwekwe kwenye mizani kwa mujibu wa sheria ambazo ziko Professor Mumba's defense of President Makvuli's heavily criticized leadership and subsequent suggestion that Africa should chart its own democratic path did not go down well with some participants like historian Dr. George Gona from the University of Nairobi during the online discussions. 
Mwalimumba Former Kenyan Chief Justice Dr. Willie Mutunga argues that the generational manipulation of the law has largely contributed to the negating of democracy in East Africa. There is consensus that you can't talk of uh, democracy under uh, colonial authoritarianism. Uh, when you, t- you trace the whole of East Africa, uh, you find how the colonial systems were set up in, in Kenya, Uganda, and, and Tanganyika, you know, after the, the Tanganyika after the First, first World War. The laws and everything else, whether it's land being taken, whether it's minerals and everything else, it was what lawyers actually call, you know, supreme theft. Because the British have a law that says that if you are not an owner, you cannot transfer a title. But they violated that completely by, in the case of Kenya, by just basically uh, taking land for free, using it for 68 years. And then we were foolish enough at, at independence to basically say, uh, we will buy, you buy it back. First of all, the Africans are represented by missionaries, particularly white people. And then they are nominated, you know, and then after nominations, just before independence, that's when you have kind of multi-racial representation in parliament. But the alleged cause, um, they were completely dominated uh, by the imperial system in uh, you know, in, in Britain, every country will know if it's Uganda, the way the British through divide and rule uh, prioritize Buganda, you know, for example, and the kingdoms. And uh, at independence, they come up with what they call the federal and the unitary, uh, you know, uh, constitution, which, which is still, I think, is still very uh, problematic. And the, in, bo- in the three countries, there is a very interesting history of the Lancaster conferences. Uh, Tanzania had theirs in, uh, in Dar es Salaam, uh, but the others were, in terms of Kenya, there were three of them uh, in, in Lancaster where these constitutions were, uh, were actually uh, negotiated. And that's when you get to uh, what we now call post-colonial authoritarianism. In the case of Kenya, we know, you know, how the constitution was very quickly changed and there were amendments and we had this, um, what we came to call the imperial presidency and uh, the one party dictatorship. And in Uganda and Tanzania, you, you get the same, there's that, that particular history, uh, Tanzania starting with uh, arguing that you know one party is the best form of government to to bring about uh, unity, and uh, even in their you know independence cons- uh, constitution, uh, uh, Tanzania uh, was able to or Tanu for that matter, the party was able to convince the British that the the constitution should not even have a bill of rights. In the case of Uganda, of course, everybody remembers the coup, uh, Obote's coup, and uh, where he drafted the constitution, 
and they went to parliament and they were told to pass it. And when they asked where the, constitution, where the draft was, they were told it was in the pigeon holes. So they would, you know, they should pass it and then read it after. The constitution making itself in East Africa, when you trace it, it's also very, very, very interesting reading in terms of uh, presidential or this imperial presidency. In recent years, many commentators in Tanzania, like Omar Said, argue that the democratic space in the country has been shrinking at an alarming rate. For the last uh, five, six, seven years, we have been experiencing what uh, hasn't been uh, thought about Tanzania before as a country which was uh, progressing towards democracy. But uh, the th there has been a high turn of events over the last five years. There has been a wide discreetly concerned by many actors. And these concerns attract not only actors in the country, but also actors in the region. Things like uh, freedom of expressions, uh, freedom to, of associations and to participate in the politics, uh, the media, freedoms have been tested in many times. Many of us thought that uh, all this happens because of the, of, the, of the constitutions, you know, the constitutions we have. The constitutions, as once said by Mualim, that we have a constitutions in the country which gives uh, dictatorial power to the president. You know, the Tanzanian constitutions, as it reads as it is now, actually uh, the, the checks and balance is not as it one would have expected that it is. Uh, we have experienced that uh, the authorities also, I mean, when I say authorities, I mean executive, taking their larger stake, their lion shares in the judiciary as well. In Tanzania, as you all might be aware, that despite uh, the widespread concerns and the long time concerns about, uh, you know, the power of the court, to, 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 to question or to look into presidential elections. You know, this, this, this is still uh, a restricted, this is still a taboo in our, in our Tanzanian constitutions. So you cannot uh, have a, a democracy in practice where presidential elections cannot be brought uh, under scrutiny and the inquiry of, 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 the, of the judiciary. We have experienced over the last two years that the electoral body ensuring that uh, the opposition candidates don't stand for elections. You know, in Tanzania, we have uh, two elections, uh, the one uh, uh, for local government and the one for parliamentary and the presidential elections. So in 2019, I think um, that we have election for local government and 85% of the opposition candidates were eliminated. On the, or are disqualified. And uh, if you hear the grounds for disqualification, you would see that where the country, the country is going, you know, you, you, the, the, the candidates who are, who, are, who, are, who, are, who are disqualified simply on the ground that uh, the name of the parties, uh, the name of the parties were misspelled. So the right to contest, the right to... Uh, the right to be elected, to participate in country's governance is taken away simply because the nomination form has a typing error. Because if somebody wants to, if, if the party is known as the Alliance for Change and the Transparency, and someone written and in a symbolic forms instead of a word forms, that right of participating in country's politics is taken away and you are disqualified. You know, these are the, some of the incidents that uh, bring a widespread concerns uh, among the actors here uh, as to whether where the country is leading. Are we going to are we leading to mono mono uh, a single party or do we still want to retain uh, a multi party? Uh, so for us uh, who are in Zanzibar, this means means something different. Uh, it means it, it, it the interpretation of it is that the ruling party is preparing to change the constitution because by uh, the setup of the Tanzanian constitution, and I'm talking of the URT constitution, United Republic, you cannot change 
the constitution if you don't have two third of of the Zanzibar parliamentarians and the two thirds of uh, Tanganyika parliamentarians. So Lugu, it's Lugu, the first time. Uh, five more minutes. Try okay. to wrap up. Yes. Thank okay. You. So, so all these, all these are, are, are issues that uh, bring concerns uh, uh, to the status of, or, uh, of a democracy uh, in Tanzania, a multi-party democracy, the future of multi-party democracy. If, uh, if there is every mechanism of make sure that, making sure that the, the oppositions are, are, are not participating uh, the concern is uh, we are heading to to the single party, uh, but but there are hopes. There are hopes uh, in the same line. The hopes are, are that uh, there's a, a a big deal of a young generation who 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 have shown interest in participating in country's politics, and uh, and this gives hopes that. Uh, young generation, young, young people are now taking a stage uh, in reforming the country's politics and all that. The democratic and political situation in Uganda has not been promising neither. Jacqueline Azimwe is a Kampala-based governance expert. Money, I think, across our three East African countries, elections are getting more and more expensive. And I think money taints our politics, taints our attempts at multi-party politics, because for now we are swayed to where the money is. And usually the money is tied to the ruling party, which is tied to the national coffers. What does it look like to generate independent parties where the majority of your people are poor, where they are for all intents and purposes, if we believe the, the, the poverty indices living on below a dollar a day, where in more developed democracies, political parties are funded by their members, but where in Uganda and probably across East Africa, a person goes to the party to get money, not to give money. So what does that or how does that affect and impact multi-party politics in our countries? That just simply explains, again, what I've said, the ruling parties usually have access to the coffers. And, and Barry, you asked, you know, how do we entrust those that steal elections to manage our countries? It's literally like trying to give a fox um, to watch over your chicken house. You, you almost certainly know what is going to happen. And, and I think until we can build trust in our systems, for change, I think that change will be hard to come by. I think of our colleagues in Zimbabwe and what they are facing now. I guess there was hope that when the late Mugabe went, that probably that was a new dawn. But while it might be easier to get rid of a Mugabe, getting rid of Mugabeism is the harder struggle. And I think that will be our struggle in Uganda. Getting rid of a Museveni, even if through a ballot, might be the easier part. But getting rid of a system that is so tied to the way we have done politics, that is the harder part. These concerns elicited more questions than answers among some participants during the online discussions on democracy in East Africa. The idea that a sitting president is invincible, that they can't be beaten, so in Tanzania now, it's, it's always being sold as a fiat, com, a fiat complaint that no one can beat Magufuli. In Uganda, in the general elections, it's almost being sold as given that nobody can beat Museveni. And people are supposed to believe that that is the position that, so, so that another result is not contemplated and another result is not considered. So I wanted to hear the panelists on, on what they think we should do one, to change the mindsets, because it seems that it's being sold to us that once in power is not possible until you are living on your own terms or until you finish your two, your two terms. My name is Mike Aboneka, and I'm an advocate from Uganda. And my question is, 
Justice uh, Emeritus talks about no need to change the constitution several times, but we need to change the leaders. And my question is, for the last 35 years or so, we've been trying to change leaders through an election, which up to now, we see as, as, as um, not something that will deliver the change that we want. How else shall we get the change we desire if the election cannot deliver it? How else can we go about it? Despite the many hurdles and challenges facing the rule of democracy in East African countries, some observers like Nairobi-based governance expert Maurice Makalo believe there is hope and light at the end of the tunnel. For me, uh, there is progress and hope in a stronger, robust civil society, despite the ebbs and flows over the years. Many of us will remember that many governments have almost had an anathemic reaction to the idea of civil society. But lately, we have governments themselves talking in terms of their partnership, the reaching out and a recognition, therefore, that civil society is a worthy and necessary partner of governments and people. And I think that's progress because it then begins to make us have a conversation and reasoning together as a family. Number two is uh, what I would call uh, stronger and fairly, uh, fairly stronger public or democratic institutions. Across all the three uh, East African countries of Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, we can say that to a degree, despite very strong pressures from the executive, from the legislature, and from other kinds of stakeholders, judiciary still continue to, to kind of have their feet. They may not be entirely as strong as we want them to be, but where it matters, we have had, they could be episodic, but even in Tanzania as we speak now, one of the biggest hopes for the people of Tanzania is the judiciary of that country. The media, despite many challenges, whether it is in terms of the ownership that determines, uh, I mean, is actually responsible for some of its weaknesses, it still remains one of the trusted institutions that is helping countries navigate through many turbulent times. Number three, for me as progress, is the youthful population that has young people of this region. They are just as committed to doing things that could change this region, but they, that they want to do it in their own way. And that maybe what they need from the other folks, the older one, is to give them the space and the trust. Number four, local governments. I think we have had quite a lot said about the national governments. But what I'm continuing to experience is to different degrees, there are many local governments that are actually beginning to demonstrate different aspects of democratic practice. Number five, I earlier on talked about demo, I mean, technology as a disruptor. There's a sense in which there is a switching of, of lights in Tanzania. Different media houses uh, being shut down, different civil society organizations being closed. And so one could say that lights in Tanzania are being figuratively switched off. The beauty with technology and where there is hope is that you could erect lighting infrastructure outside of Tanzania and still beam into Tanzania with the effect that there is no country that can ever be so totally closed as not to be uh, kept accountable or held uh, to some degree of, um, of light. And I think that's a hope too, uh, you know, for this region. From these candid online discussions hosted by the East Africa Law Society, it is an open secret that democracy is facing many challenges in East Africa. Independent analysts believe the forthcoming general election in Tanzania is a mere formality 
Owing to a myriad of democratic challenges the fragmented opposition is facing against the incumbent, John Pombe Maguvuli. But despite the political uncertainty in the country, many believe and hope that stability and tranquility will prevail after the election.